everyone. So welcome to my talk. My name is Nick Van Wurdenberg. I'm the CEO of Wrangle.io. We're an Angular development shop. Uh, we were actually founded uh, specifically around Angular when it came out and sort of the impact that had on the market. And uh, we've worked on a lot of Angular projects. And my talk today is on how to build an Angular app or how to build Angular apps with a absent without leave API. Because the bane of, of any Angular project ultimately is how you work with the API. And we've had lots of uh, fun experiences doing that. So an obvious fact, Angular apps use APIs. And uh, if you don't have an API, then your app isn't going to really do much. But there's been a big shift in the industry. You know, Angular apps are built by front-end engineers. There's been a shift where we've had you know, front-end and back-end developers. We went with the full stack. But when doing front-end engineering and building a significant app that runs in the browser, uh, especially with companies that have a different technology in the back-end, we have a, a much sort of bigger shift back to specialization. So we're building the Angular app. Someone else is building the API, and, and we've got to work together. And so we, we sort of call, jokingly, that's a middle-end engineer. It's, it's a person building the application logic that sits in the middle. It's not a front-end developer. It's not a back-end developer. But sort of like all of the, the skills and experience in the back-end context applied with some of the skills in the front-end, and it's a different skill set. But now you've got to work with the back-end team. How do you do that? You know, that's where do the APIs come from? They don't magically appear. I have had one project out of 30 where there was an API that worked and uh, didn't have to be changed. Every other one has had significant issues, delays, challenges. Sadly, APIs do not come from the stork. They don't get delivered magically. This guy doesn't bring them either. There's a back-end team somewhere. They're built by a services team typically now. And your services team is happily working, building data, and shipping it over. These are JSON cars, if you didn't know. And they arrive in your app, and you, you work with them. But you know, typically, you start on a project. And the early days, often these APIs are built by a team that has an existing web application. And they have the pressure to move to mobile. They have to provide a better user experience. And so they're re-architecting. They're taking their PHP app, or their .NET app, or their Java app, and they're putting an API on it. They're turning it into a service-oriented architecture. Um, but that's often a new skill set for that team, and it doesn't go as smooth as possible. So building your Angular app and getting all excited and you know, latching on to that JSON API, getting those calls, this is what you get. You know, it's not a nice orderly sort of API. There's response code issues. You're supposed to get integers. You get strings. Uh, it was supposed to be a RESTful API. It's an RPC API, uh, something that was supposed to be ready in, I don't know, what makes sense. So uh, one project, it was supposed to be ready in two days. It took six weeks. Every day, we were waiting for the API. Uh, six weeks later, we got it, and it mostly worked. Mostly. It was another two weeks before it was like working properly. Another project, I thought it would be a week. It took eight weeks, and it still didn't work. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but we ended up just going through this loop where we were writing the Angular app. Something would break. We'd tell them it was the API. They'd tell us it was our fault. And it was taking an hour or two hours just to discuss any sort of issue that came up in the API. So we built a full test suite against the API, validated the API, and uh, connected our app, which we'd worked built offline, to that API once it passed the validation suite. And so, you know, what does this mean for, for Angular developers? And, and most people building Angular apps, it's, it's a new architecture. It's a new way of building an app. And so these are, you know, new experiences. Fundamentally, you need a setup that allows you to work with a broken API delivered late. That's got to be your fundamental starting assumption for building a large Angular application where you're working with a different back-end team. Unless, you know, I guess you could have a project where the back-end team could build the API, work on it for a couple of months, and then you start the front-end. But you might not have the right API. It really depends on how you're exploring your market. That's often defining the APIs, and the front-end's an important part of that. You can take an approach where every time you want to build a new feature in the Angular app, you've got to tell the back-end team, you know, hey, I need this. You've got to wait a couple of days. You sort of get it. Uh, the drag on that, that can add like 30% or more to your development costs because you're always having to handle this handoff and, and work back and forth. So it's not a great way to work. Or what you can do is find a way to allow you to build quickly without too much investment in a back-end. You know, how can you build the front end without being tied to the back end? And so that's where we come in here, uh, experience with 30 plus Angular projects, you know, fundamental learning. The API is always late. Like one out of 30, it wasn't late. It is always, always late. If you're new to Angular and you're starting a project, this is your starting 
assumption. You got to worry about this guy. It's not bugs, it's rabbits. They're late. That didn't make sense, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> the API is always broken, right? Maybe not broken this bad, but it's broken. Sometimes it is broken this bad. Um, the API is always changing. So it's all working great, and then your app's out there, or it's almost done, and all of a sudden things just start failing in completely random ways. Sometimes it's because there's other services consuming the API, and they make a little change, and they don't really think about talking about it. Um, think, strange things, different response codes, you know, things that were strings become integers. Um, just, it's always changing. The slide had a picture, but we're, we're changing it, so it's not there. It's like an API that just went out of... Uh, so what do you do? And, and this is going to sound sacrilegious. This is going to be like, oh my God, this is like insane. But what you need to do to do this effectively is write documentation. Because you cannot collaborate on, with a REST API team building an Angular app using agile practices because there isn't any sort of synchronization and time on that. You're working on the front end. They're working on the back end. And they're going at completely different speeds. There's, there's, it's not really easy to synchronize. And so what you really do need to do, and this is a, a, an agile principle that we talk about a lot, if you have a long separation in time between when you have a discussion over something and when it's actually built to have that validation step, you need to document it because you're going to forget everything. All that context is lost. You know, so you had a discussion, you explained exactly why you needed these kind of response codes, and it's lightly documented or, not, you know, like a, a single user story. Well, when they get to that on the back end two months later, they're not going to remember. And so have a very robust API documentation with the response codes and keep it up to date and use that as the collaboration point between the front end and the back end teams. Um, that's the only thing that really works. And it works extremely well and it's not that much of a burden. And you can generate a lot of this documentation automatically over time. Um, document the data packages. It's amazing how often you think you have the API defined, but you didn't actually define the JSON and what kind of impact that has. Um, don't over-design the API, though, in the documentation. Don't try to think too hard about what you're going to need in the future, because that's going to change. Um, but document it. And then that becomes the discussion point. And when the API team starts giving you APIs that are nothing like the ones you've documented, and they'll even try to do that if you have documented it, um, you can point back to that, and that was the agreement, and you can have a little discussion over that. Because everyone has different ideas of how APIs should be built. So, now when you get to that point, you're working on your front end, well, how do you do this? Because there's no back end. How do you collaborate? How do you work? You know. So working with the back end API, you know, you're building the client, someone else provides the API. We talked about that. You're going to have a lot of discussions and arguments and holy wars about what's a good RESTful API. Um, who will test the API? So this was another big learning that we just finally gave up on it, and we test the API. So we use super test a lot, and we write a test suite against the API. And we did that on one project where it was week after week after week. We were burning hours every day on phone calls with the developers. And uh, we wrote a test suite, and every morning we ran it, and we sent them the error results, and you know, we spent a day and a half, two days writing the test suite, but after that, it was a couple of minutes a day to run it, send it to them, they fixed it, we kept running it. And then when it finally passed, then we would start cutting over from, which I'll talk about in a second, our mocks to the backend API. And yeah, when will it be ready? I talked about that earlier. It will be ready, but you have maybe no idea when. And it will be late, and it will be broken. Translation sheet, this is very helpful in having API discussions. It's working now. It's working, but for who? And uh, what does working mean? Define working. It's like, you know, define done. Um, it's working, but it hasn't been tested and will probably be redesigned as the project unfolds. That's another really good point. You have an API, it existed for something else, and there's a feeling that it's close to being ready, but it's not. Because this API may have been for data systems, you're building an Angular app or a mobile app, and you want to really make sure you have a good API with a good data format coming across. You do not want to handcuff your future, the future of your company or your, of your application by letting that sort of god-awful MySQL data model leaking through into your API signature. There will be a lot of redesign. We'll have it in a few days. Don't believe it. Uh, 
we were talking with a company about this, and they just started laughing. They almost fell off their chairs because they went through this, but it wasn't like eight weeks. It took them a year and a half before they finally got the API that they were promised. Um, we're working on it. That's great, but you may have to do all your work before you actually see it. Prepare for the worst. A broken API delivered late in the project. So that raises the question, well, maybe if we try a little harder, we can figure this out a little more ahead of time. Well, that's sort of the history of software that generally doesn't work. Um, what, but here are some of the things that sort of come out of it that from our looking at it. The existing API is low level and doesn't fit the need for a REST API and client access. You want a higher level document-based you know, API returning higher level data structures, and most APIs are low level sort of transactional data-centric APIs. And the job and the effort to go from one to the other is massive. The prior database schema doesn't map well to the future REST API JSON document schema. So you got to do a lot of work, a lot of translation. Um, this might impact some of the scalability in the application. Often what you have, and that's a different talk entirely, but when you're thinking about this and you're building a service-oriented architecture to support an Angular app, uh, thinking about what you're going to do from a caching perspective can be very helpful because it can save you from over-engineering some of the work as you try to get this done. Um, you know, using Redis and, and pre-caching some of your results can be very helpful. Um, this is a big one. I think this is the main reason we're so wrong about how long an API is going to take. We think we're just chopping the head off a prior application and we're just going to have, you know, some of these services and controllers that were there for that legacy server-side application. We're just going to throw up a few extra lines of code and we're going to have an API, but what people don't realize is that legacy business rules are scattered everywhere. And even if you think you've done a, a good job, and you have done a good job, there's still tons and tons of business rules that are in the UI layer. And you've got to move those back into the API now. And that's actually one reason with a lot of existing software companies, we recommend, you know, even if you're going to take your PHP and your Java or your .NET and turn it into a great service-oriented architecture, if you put another service layer in front of it, maybe in Node, maybe in something else, that allows you to invest a lot less effort in converting your legacy software into a REST API because you can move some of those business rules in the layer in front and not have to really write that much code, and you can leave your services, your legacy services, in this sort of in-between state where they are not fully sort of embracing the new REST API and data model, but getting close enough, and then that last layer that serves up to the application is the one that packages up everything very nicely, you know, it sort of incorporates some of the caching with Memcache or Redis, and uh, it allows you to have different sort of focuses on different layers in your API architecture. So. We call this a hack stack. You know, how, do you, how can you build an Angular app without a back end? You need to be able to write code. How do you do that? You need to set up, you can work with a broken API delivered late, um, or you want to work on a quick prototype. A lot of the stuff that you might want to do in a hackathon you know, applies. Um, it's not a library or tool, but a set of best practices based upon experience. And this has a huge impact on velocity since it streamlines what otherwise is a very painful workflow. Um, you know, we don't often realize what these, any kind of break in our flow and a conversation that's required to resolve something, what that impact is on productivity, and it's massive. Some agile considerations as well, right? So you're building something in an agile manner. How deep is the user story? If it's thin, complete, and fully delivered, um, that's ideal. That's, you know, what you want to do. It's a slice of your app, but APIs confound this, right? So what are you going to do, stop and get that API and build that whole feature? There's, you know, there's a, a real dysfunction here in trying to run an agile process with teams that are working across a REST API boundary. Yeah, how to handle the crossing of the API boundary? Um, do you want to do a single story or two stories? There's a lot of interesting considerations there. Um, generally, we try to work it so that we can build without needing the API. We go as deep as possible. We define the REST API. We define the performance criteria. We define almost everything about it. We finish the story on the front end, and we want to have just a tiny bit of work at the integration stage layer, later. If you leave too much there, you have this technical debt that you're not perceiving. And so we try to go deep, and we talk with the API team. We define performance characteristics, and we're doing this sort of quasi mini waterfall sort of approach at the API level because there's just no way to synchronize these two effectively and still work at a good pace. And it works fairly well because it's a good abstract separation of concerns 
Um, there's four kinds of stacks that you can use for working you know, on the front end without a back end. You could use a back end as a service, a Firebase, Parse. Um, you can go with a mean stack with a REST API mapper. Uh, we have an open source product called Coast that we use. Um, this is just a way to quickly build out a dev server. We've done this on a number of projects, especially earlier ones. We set up Mongo, we set up Node, we built the front end, and we gave the API definition to the client, and they reworked their .NET server to basically then substitute in for that back end server. But that's a lot of work still. Um, there's API services such as Apiary or Swagger. Um, we find those tend to be still fairly limited. And what we often do is something a little more Angular sort of oriented. We take a TDD Angular service driven approach. And this gets into you know, how you architect an Angular application. And uh, I think most you know, really good production Angular applications end up being a composition of Angular services. And some of those services are the lower level data layer. And you can mock that out and use your test driven approaches to create both your tests and your mock data. And so an agile insight where code can't be the documentation, you're delivering and validating in a you know, real agile sort of manner, documentation must be written, which I was mentioned a few minutes ago. So another way to call this is your API therapy stack 101, building a hack stack. Document the API. So allows you to start making assumptions. Probably not that many binders, hopefully. Um, it can earth problems that would lead later to delays. Um, Apiary can be useful or similar services, but Google Docs can be fine or Word documents. We, we typically go with that. It's just easier to bang out the, the information. Uh, when, you document, when you document the API, you can start making assumptions. It can earth problems that would later lead to uh, What happened there? There we go, mocking the API. So this is our preferred approach. Uh, TDD, the first thing to try, you're doing test-driven development, you're creating mocks, you're creating some data. You can expand that out a bit and uh, that can actually help you run your app, sort of disconnected from the back end. Um, mock server can work well, but can be expensive. And client-side mocking. So you, know, you can actually do your test-driven development and work your client-side mocking with a lot of the same uh, code. So here's one scenario, your tasks endpoint. Uh, we expect eventually to have a task endpoint that would give us REST access to tasks. Awesome. We agreed on what the return JSON would look like and the, you know, the services team is working on that. Uh, we've also agreed on how problems are going to be handled. That's the other huge thing. When something fails, um, there's just so, like a, a, probably a good third of, of an API project is handling those exceptions and people actually don't think about them uh, generally when defining an API and you start fixing these one at a time. Um, now you're waiting for the endpoint, so let's get building an Angular app. So client-side mocking. So leave our task services out of it, uh, but we have to proxy all of our API calls through the API proxy that will be in the mocking. So we'll go into that a little more. We can put mock data into a mock test mock data service, and we can put mock logic into a task mock service. Posts, puts, et cetera, can modify data and memory. Refactor common logic into a mock endpoint service. So what we're doing here is we're building out our Angular app, we're creating services, and we're separating those concerns, and we're injecting them into our tests. And we have an API service or similar, we'll direct API requests to the mock services when appropriate. So you can actually mix the two together. So if you have a service here, you want to get tasks, you're calling the API, that's what it would look like in a simplified non-production sort of format. But we can also separate it out. Uh, we can create our mock data. So we're doing a value here and uh, we're separating this out so we can use it in different places. You can use this in a test or in your mocks. You can generate data. There's some great services for that. And then you can do some trivial mock logic. So you're taking, uh, creating task mocks, you're injecting the task mocks data, and uh, you're pulling in that task list and you're returning it, and you know, presto, you've got a service, and from a controller perspective, it can't really tell the difference. And generally, make sure to return promises because that really simplifies a lot of this as you build up through a services chain. So mock likely problems, a slow connection with a timeout, drop connection, server-side errors, loss of authentication, 
So here's an example of mocking latency. And so you can see here we're injecting different services and we're composing our sort of mock data. I won't spend a lot of time on these. You can sort of look at the slides later if you like. Uh, control latency with a constant. Um, mocking dropped calls, waiting a random time and maybe drop the connection. That's a huge thing to test. We actually have a Faraday cage in the office for testing cell phone reception getting cut out, which is pretty cool. It's made out of tinfoil. Um, you put the phone in and try to do things. Oh, when the API arrives, one day the real API does arrive. Yahoo. All right. So test it with Postman. So, you know, generally just get a look at it, see if it's actually returning the data it's supposed to. It often isn't. Maybe write a test suite with SuperTest. Um, dealing with changes. Run the API server locally. You know, use uh, Vagrant there. This is really important because if you start connecting to an API service and they're still working on it, it's going to break all the time. And you're going to get stuck for a day not being able to run your app because it's breaking. So control the changes to the API and uh, or you work off of a, a remote API server that you own and it gets updated in a controlled manner. Control the schedule for when those changes are being pushed out and set up a toggle between client-side mocks and the real API so that you don't get stuck with something that you can't work on because it's gone out of service for a while. Um, working in a hybrid mode, you can mix in data from live APIs and mocks, filtering API data through a mock layer. So you have an API, but it's not exactly what you want, so pull it through a, a mock layer and, and annotate it and decorate it and you know, manipulate it as you will. Um, use a proxy server. So, you know, for where cores is an issue, um, just proxy it. You can mix real and mock data. So here we have our task mock data and the mock endpoint. And then what we're doing is we're making a call to get information and we're just going to mix the stuff together and then return it. We can proxy a server pretty easily. I mean, this is a brutally simple proxy. This is for building, not for production deployment. Um, you wouldn't want to do that, but uh, you know, a really quick way to get data and sort of send it over, pipe it to your app. And uh, yeah, so using the proxy server, and that's it. So uh, a few other thoughts, just. It, yeah, I mean, just basically, it's going to be late, it's going to be broken, and uh, it's going to be awkward, so plan for it. So, thank you.